In human body, we have many different spaces that contain our organs, and we name these spaces cavities. First of all, the reason that we need to have different body cavities is simply because we want to keep these organs separated from one another. Just as an example, brain is the master of our mind and is located inside a space that is called cranial cavity. You do not want brain to sit close to, for example, heart, because at rest, heart beats about 70 to 75 times per minute. So this is a highly active organ which moves constantly, and you don't want to place heart near the brain, because in that case, heart keep hitting and traumatizing the brain. If you look at the architectural design of our body, you notice that one of the most important organ, which would be brain because it controls many activities in our body, is located farthest from the floor and just think about it if you are accidentally falling down let's say you lose your balance you use your different body parts including your limbs to make sure that your head does not hit the ground in this video i walk you through some major cavities including cranial cavity then i talk about vertebral or spinal cavity which contains spinal cord in facial region we have two orbital cavities obviously eyeballs are located there we have two nasal cavities we have one oral cavity and please keep in mind that also deep inside we do have tympanic cavities tympanic cavity would be the cavity that includes some of our ear structures when we get to the trunk in our trunk we have chest or thoracic cavity and thoracic cavity is separated from the largest cavity in our body by a muscle named diaphragm so diaphragm is the partition between thoracic cavity and abdominal pelvic cavity as you can see abdominal pelvic cavity extend from diaphragm to the groin so these are the cavities that we're going to learn about in this video and we talk about some important anatomical structures that we find in each one of these cavities. Brain sits inside a cavity that is made by eight cranial bones named cranial cavity. If I remove this section of the brain, then we can see the inside of the cranial cavity. The bones that form cranial cavity include frontal bone, sphenoid bone, temporal bones, we have two temporal bones, on the back we have occipital bone, on both sides we have two parietal bones, so right now I'm looking at mid-sagittal section of the right parietal bone, and here in the cranial floor we have part of the ethmoid bone, and between these cranial bones we have the type of joints that they do not move, we name them sutures, obviously we're talking about the cranial cavity of an adult. As you see there are many structures that protect brain, for example, here we have hair, which has many functions, including protecting the brain from trauma. We have skin, and we know below skin, we have subcutaneous layer, which is filled with mostly adipose tissue, fat tissue, and we know fat tissue is a good cushion. Then we have the cranial bones, and we know that these cranial bones are flat bones, but in a flat bone, we know that the spongy bone, which is slightly weaker, is in the middle, and below the periosteum, recall periosteum is the outer covering of the bone, we find compact bones. So even the design of our flat bones makes them very protective of, for example, a structure such as brain. Around brain, we have three meningeal layers. The outer layer is dura mater, the middle layer is arachnoid mater, and the inner layer that is attached to the brain is pia mater. And please keep in mind, these three meningeal layers of brain continue and they are attached to the three meningeal layers that we have around spinal cord. Cranial cavity is connected to the spinal cavity. Brain and spinal cord together form the central nervous system so that should make sense that the cavity that contains brain should be connected to the cavity that contains spinal cord. Here a section of occipital bone has been removed to expose brain. For example, right now I'm pointing at the two cerebellar hemispheres. Brain is connected to the spinal cord. So this yellow structure is spinal cord and we see that from spinal cord we have the origin of spinal nerves. As you see, spinal nerves exit the central nervous system 
through some openings that we have between the vertebral bones. Between the two vertebral bones, we have a foramen, an opening that is called intervertebral foramen. So that's the place that the spinal nerve exit and then moves toward its effectors. Spinal cord continue its growth after birth. Usually around age five, a spinal cord stop growing. Basically, it gets to its maximum length. So spinal cord in general is much shorter than our vertebral column. Please keep in mind in an adult, vertebral column is formed by 26 bones. Seven of them are located in cervical region. So we have seven cervical vertebral bones. We have 12 thoracic vertebral bones. We have five lumbar vertebral bones, one sacrum and one coccyx. Spinal cord is much shorter than the length of the vertebral column. When we look for the end of spinal cord, at the level of the intervertebral disc, that would be the cartilage that we have between two vertebral bones, at the level of intervertebral disc between L1 and L2. So that would be L1, this would be L2. At that level, we look for the end of the spinal cord and we name the end of spinal cord canis medullaris. When I grab one of these thoracic vertebral bones out, you notice that in the bone we have an opening that is called vertebral foramen and that would be one of the intervertebral discs. Through these intervertebral discs, these bones articulate with one another and their foramina form a canal and we name this canal vertebral or spinal cavity. That's exactly where we look for spinal cord. So that's a section of the spinal cord and as you can see, it would be located inside the vertebral cavity. So I place this back and let's acknowledge that bones are not the only structures that protect the spinal cord. Here we have a closer view of the three meningeal layers. That would be the dura mater, the outer layer. This would be arachnoid mater, middle layer, and pia mater is attached to the spinal cord. Between dura mater, the outer layer, and the bone, we have a space, we call this space, my pen is in this space, epidural space. This space is filled with different connective tissues, including fat tissue. So that would be the epidural space, mostly containing fat tissue, and we know fat is a great cushion. And also when we say we have epidural injection, clearly we are injecting the substance, let's say anesthetic or painkiller, inside this space. So that would be how the vertebral cavity forms by these vertebral bones. As you see, when we get to canis medullaris, which is the end of spinal cord, below that, inside the vertebral cavity, we do have spinal nerves. And we know that eventually spinal nerves exit the vertebral cavity through intervertebral foramina. Here we have a view of the left orbital cavity. That's the place that we're looking for eyeball. But please keep in mind, it's not just eyeball. When I grab this eyeball, we can see superior and lateral to the eyeball, we have some glands named lacrimal glands. These are the ones that secrete lacrimal fluid or tear. We also have extraocular muscles, those muscles that are moving our eyeball, and that would be part of the optic nerve. That's the one that sends visual signals to the brain. And when I look deep inside the orbital cavity, I can locate the optic canal. That's exactly the pathway for optic nerve to get inside the cranial cavity because the goal is to send the visual signals to the brain. Orbital cavity is made of several bones. We can see some of them in this model. For example, I can see that the roof is made of frontal bone on the medial side. We have a small bone named lacrimal bone, ethmoid bone. We have sphenoid bone. And then here we can see a very small section of zygomatic bone. And please keep in mind that exactly the place that I'm pointing at, which would be a section in the floor of orbital cavity, we have maxillary bone and palatine bone. So several bones form the orbital cavity. Then here I can see the right nasal cavity. Please keep in mind we have two nasal cavities. They're separated by nasal septum. However, in this model, we don't see nasal septum. We can see that the front of the nose is made of layers of hyaline cartilage. 
The reason that we need the front of our nose to be cartilage is mostly because sometimes we need to dilate our air pathway. So having cartilage here allows you, for example, when you're exercising, to dilate your nostrils so more air can get in and out of the nasal cavity. In general, there are several bones that form the nasal cavities. We can see some of them in the model. For example, on the lateral wall of nasal cavity, we see three pairs of nasal conchi. Obviously, I'm pointing at the right nasal conchi. The superior and middle nasal conchi are part of ethmoid bone. Inferior nasal conchi, that's the right one, are facial bones. Also, when we look at the floor of the nasal cavity, please keep in mind, the floor of nasal cavity is the roof of oral cavity. That would be palate. The front of palate is hard palate because it has bones such as maxillary bones, and palatine bones. The back of palate is soft palate because it does not have bone. And also when we look at the nasal septum, in nasal septum we find a bone named vomer and also we have part of the ethmoid bone. And then the rest of the nasal cavity, for example the ceiling and also the back wall formed by ethmoid bone and sphenoid bone and let's not forget the actual nasal bones and also a section of frontal bone. Then we get inside the oral cavity, which we have some important structures here, including our maxillary and mandibular teeth, tongue, and as you can see in the mouth floor, we find two pairs of our salivary glands. That would be sublingual salivary gland, and this is submandibular salivary glands. And as you can see, we have also muscles and blood vessels. So that's what we can say for now about the oral cavity. In this model, we cannot get inside the tympanic cavities, but let's acknowledge inside the tympanic cavities, we do have some very small bones. We call them ossicles. And also we have some very small muscles. Thoracic cavity or chest cavity forms by several anatomical structures. Right here, we have a bone that is called sternum or breastbone, and we have 12 pairs of ribs. As you see between the ribs, we have muscles. We name them intercostal muscles. When we go to the posterior of thoracic cavity, we find 12 thoracic vertebral bones. The floor of thoracic cavity is diaphragm, this muscle. Diaphragm is the one that separates thoracic cavity from abdominal pelvic cavity. Inside the thoracic cavity, we have several important visceral organs, including the two lungs, heart, some large blood vessels, and when I remove these organs, you can see some other structures. Since the heart and lungs have movement constantly, they are moving, Obviously, during inhalation and exhalation, we expect lungs to move. And we know that even when we are at rest, heart beats about 70 to 75 times per minute. We dedicate a cavity, a space to each one of these three organs. That simply means each lung is located inside a space that is called pleural cavity. So we have two pleural cavities inside each one of them we find one lung and we place heart inside one space that is called pericardial cavity and in these cavities the two pleural cavities and pericardial cavity we find a very narrow space filled with a fluid named serous fluid to reduce friction and allow these organs to move easily so we can say that inside the thoracic cavity we have smaller cavities dedicated to these three important visceral organs. I removed the lungs. Now we have a frontal view of the two lungs. And quickly, we take a look at this space that we have between the two lungs. I'm pointing at this space that is called mediastinum. As you see, heart is inside the mediastinum. So in short, if you want to give instruction to someone to find heart you say that in human body go to thoracic cavity then in thoracic cavity go inside the mediastinum the space that we have between the two lungs inside the mediastinum you find a space called pericardial cavity deep inside you find the heart i see some large blood vessels also located in mediastinum space for example that's pulmonary trunk that's the artery that receives the oxygenated blood from the heart and then send it to the two lungs. 
So we know inside the lungs, blood becomes oxygenated. That would be aorta. Aorta receives oxygenated blood from the heart and send it to our organs and systems. That's a vein named superior vena cava. Superior vena cava brings the oxygenated blood from the upper part of the body back to the heart. When I remove the heart, we can see some other structures also located inside the mediastinum. For example, that's trachea, one of our airways, and these are the primary bronchi. As you see, they are located in mediastinum. They are pathways for air to get in and out of the lungs. Behind trachea, we see this tube, which is esophagus. That's the pathway for food and drink. So that also passes through the mediastinum. Here we can see part of the aorta. Aorta is a very long artery. We named this section of aorta that is above diaphragm, thoracic aorta. So as you see, that also passes through the mediastinum. Even though the model does not show it, but if we are looking for thymus, that's the place that, for example, T cells become immunocompetent, become ready to get involved in fight, we find thymus also in mediastinum region. Abdominal pelvic cavity is the largest cavity in human body. We divide it into abdominal cavity and pelvic cavity. There is no anatomical structure that separates abdominal cavity from pelvic cavity. What we do, we use an imaginary line that connects one of the extensions of the right hip bone to the left hip bone, and we consider the space above that abdominal and the space below that pelvic cavity. In abdominal cavity, we have some important structures. For example, liver. Below liver, we see gallbladder, the storage of bile. When I go to the left side, I see stomach. If I remove these two organs, we can see, for example, here, a vein that is called inferior vena cava. This vein sends the oxygenated blood from the lower part of the body back to the heart. So part of inferior vena cava also passes through the abdominal. When I move to the left hypochondriac region, I see this highly vascularized organ, which is called spleen. This is the one that filters and cleans blood. And then we see small intestine in the abdominal cavity, and most of the large intestine also passes through the abdominal cavity. However, when we get to end of the large intestine, which include rectum and anus, they're located in pelvic cavity. I quickly remove this to basically show you part of the rectum and when we continue going down we get inside the anal canal. They're located in pelvic cavity. That's why we say most of the large intestine is in abdominal cavity but a small section of it would be found in pelvic cavity. Here we have another section of aorta which is called abdominal aorta. Part of it also passes through the abdominal cavity. When I get inside the pelvic cavity first thing that I notice aside from sections of large intestine would be the presence of urinary bladder the storage for urine that is located inside the pelvic cavity also internal organs of genital system or we can say reproductive system are found inside the pelvic cavity for example since this is a male model if I'm looking for glands such as prostate gland seminal glands I should find them inside the pelvic cavity please note that in general genital system, we also have external genital organs. For example, in male, we have penis and we have scrotum, the sac that has testes inside and also has some structures that we call them epididymis. They're locations for maturation and storage of sperm. They are located outside the pelvic cavity. If we look at a female human body inside the pelvic cavity, we see above urinary bladder, we have the muscular organ, uterus. Also, also, inside the pelvic cavity, we can look for some internal organs of female genital system, including ovaries, ovarian ligaments, fallopian tube. They are all located inside the pelvic cavity. Recall that the external genitalia of female is called vulva. Obviously, vulva is not inside the pelvic cavity. We find it externally located. So these are some important structures that we find in abdominal cavity and in pelvic cavity. Please note that those organs that I did not talk about, for example, kidneys or suprarenal glands, they are considered retroperitoneal. In separate video, I will walk you through the location of those organs. I hope you find this helpful.